Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 159. Shane Mahoney, conservation and wildlife, you never run out of lessons. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey everyone, it's Eva Shockey. You're about to listen to another great episode of Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm Chrissy Titus. I'm co-host of RNES female television show and NRA I Am Forever. Gear up for another amazing episode with Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is Tim Salerno with Salerno Brothers. Hi, this is Randy Salerno with Salerno Brothers. Get ready to listen to another great episode of the Big yep. Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and you know what? Thank you for pushing that play button right there on your audio device. Whatever you're listening on, whether it's your phone or maybe you're in your car or your Jeep and you're going up a mountainside and you're taking the drive up to your favorite spot where the sun's rising and you're listening to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast right now, getting ready for deer season that's right around the corner. And in fact, it started in some places in the country. And my good friend Dusty Phillips, who I know is listening to me right now, is also getting ready for deer season that is right around the corner. I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of pumped up about it. What's going on, Dusty? Yeah, who's not pumped up about it? You know, you you get to that point during the season, you know, the previous year season, and you're like, man, I'm just over this. But the next, the day after closing season date, you're like, oh my gosh, man, why, why did I even have the negative thought of is this already over? Right. You know, why, why did I do that? It's like you can't, you can't like wrap your mind around it during season, but after it's over, you're like, man, I just wish I had another week. I always feel like August is like that month where deer season kind of kicks into high gear in a sense. Like it's, it's that scouting month where you re, I mean, you scout all year, but you kind of start focusing more because you know, it's in a, you know, 45 days, it's going to be here. I always feel like August is like that month. It's not the July heat. You know, there's not a heat wave that comes through. Typically it's a little cooler evenings, especially towards the end. Soccer starting up makes me think of fo- foliage. August is that month for me. Yeah, yeah, I agree to that. Uh, you know, the the bucks here in Ohio are definitely packing some really nice velvet headgear and driving down the road and seeing a nice buck stand out in the soybean field. Man, just to, to get your mind thinking about it. And you see the fawns running around, you know, they're starting to get where they're big enough to yep. be up the fields on their own a little bit now. And they're uh, they're starting to venture out more and you're seeing them more. And, you know, what I've seen here in Ohio that uh, our herd's real healthy and fawns everywhere. The wife and I were sitting on the deck on Sunday morning drinking a coffee just a little after sunrise, and uh, uh, there's a fawn that walks right up through our wiffle ball field and looks right at us 10 yards away and tries to figure out what the heck the fence is all about and actually found the one corner smart enough to go around the fence and then you know danced around the backyard for a little while and hit it into the woods. Okay, and that's pretty cool. It was pretty cool. It's the same yard I actually had shared a moment on Facebook the other day where there were, I don't know, 50-something turkeys, there were three or four hens and a bunch of poults walking through the same backyard. And it, and it, kinda, it reminds me of the conservation efforts that have been made in New Hampshire and the United States because at one point there were no turkeys in New Hampshire back in the 70s. They took 25 from New York, put them in New Hampshire, and now, and you can attest to this because you, you actually came from Ohio to hunt turkeys in New Hampshire. I'll do it again in a heartbeat. And you do it in a heartbeat because the turkey hunting is that good. And there were that many turkeys walking through my backyard last year. It's the most turkeys I'd ever seen. So that's a conservation success story in itself. 
And I bring that up because our guest this week is Shane Mahoney, who's probably the world-renowned Shane Mahoney conservationist. I'm not sure there's anybody that really talks more or is as passionate and sends and spends as much time sending his message about conservation to the world, more so than Shane. And he actually was came in heavily requested by a lot of our listeners, especially after we talked about high fence hunting in our previous show to discuss Shane's view. And we certainly got all that, but we talk about so much more from where he came from, where his origins were, his foundation, why he became the conservationist that he is, and all his viewpoints about all kinds of conservation and whether it's in good shape, bad shape, you're going to hear all right here in our interview with Shane Mahoney. So before we get to Shane Maloney, Jay, we need to get with Jim Keller for the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. For this week's Deer News, we're going to do something a little different. There is a multi-topic article on DeerAndDeerHunting.com that we will base this week's news on, since each topic has excellent information. The article is a summary of the studies revealed in the 2016 Southeast Deer Study Group meeting held in February in Athens, Georgia, and attended by 296 deer biologists from across the country. The article was written by Bob Zaglin, who was a guest contributor to the Deer and Deer Hunting website. Another thing to note about this episode is it will be recorded for the last time in the old Charles Street Closet Studios. So for our first story this week, Young Bucks vs. Old Bucks, How They Behave Differently. Most deer hunters agree that older bucks are much more smarter than younger males and harder to hunt. Now, that's been quantified. Using fine-scale movement data of whitetails from GPS-collared bucks, Auburn graduate student Clint McCoy and his associates focused on how adult white-tailed bucks react to hunting pressure. They wanted to see if older males are actually harder to hunt because they're smarter than younger bucks or are simply rare, making it more difficult for hunters to encounter them. McCoy and his associates captured and GPS-collared 37 bucks during a three-year period in South Carolina. The collars recorded buck locations every 30 minutes from late August through November, which encompasses most of the deer hunting season. Besides the variables of date, age, and time, GPS locations were assigned attributes such as distance to the nearest hunting stand and whether the animal was on a food plot, bait site, or hunting stand buffer. The results showed that the adult bucks were about 55 yards farther from the hunting blinds on the final day of the study versus the first day and 17.5 yards farther from stands during daylight than dark. In comparison, yearling bucks were 16.7 yards closer to the hunting stands at the end of the study compared to the beginning and 15.1 yards closer to hunting stands during daylight versus dark. Researchers also found that adult bucks were 80% less likely to visit bait sites during daylight at the end of the study. To the contrary, yearlings were twice as likely as adults to use bait sites during daylight. Science versus popular opinion, the politics of deer management, balancing public opinion with science. All biologists agree that wildlife management decisions should be based on science. However, decisions are increasingly affected by public opinion, which is often backed up politically, making it more challenging for wildlife agencies to use science-based facts to address deer management problems and concerns. From insurance agencies to average citizens to the deer farming community, the ability to manage deer herds is continually being strained, and the next generation of managers must figure out how to manage deer in a way that's beneficial to the public resource and acceptable to its constituents. As important as science is to deer, management must also take a common sense approach. New hunter recruitment issues. Deer managers are also concerned about hunter recruitment. Although recent statistics documented a slight increase in United States hunter numbers, that might not be the case in Virginia, according to Matt Knox of the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. According to Knox and his associates, licensed big game hunters have decreased significantly in Virginia the past two decades, from 294,000 in 1993 to 223,000 in 2012. This represented an overall decline of 24% and an annual decline of 1.2%. Based on those statistics, there may only be about 188,000 big game hunters by 2023 and as few as 133,000 in 2038 in Virginia. Such declines have a significant negative effect on department finances and, more important, Virginia's ability to manage the state's deer herd. The lone positive aspect Knox addressed was the increasing number of women who are hunting. 
bow hunting recovery rates. The effectiveness of fixed broadheads versus mechanical broadheads was investigated by Andy Peterson and his colleagues at the Naval Support Facility Indian Head at Indian Head, Maryland. The objective of their study was to evaluate deer recovery metrics of bow hunters shooting compound bows or crossbows with fixed blade broadheads versus mechanical broadheads. Information was gathered daily from the archers participating in the managed hunting program at the Naval Support Facility Indian Head. All participants were required to pass the International Bow Hunters Education Program in an annual preseason shooting proficiency test. Since the beginning of the study in 1989 until the 2012 season, that is 24 seasons, 209 bow hunters logged 35,011 hours, recovering 1,083 or 83.6% of the 1,296 deer recorded as being hit. The choice of weapon was found to have little effect on recovery rates with recovery rates for compounds and crossbows at 83 and 89% respectively. However, the type of broadhead affected recovery rates for crossbows and compound bow users significantly. In the context of the study, investigators recommend using mechanical broadheads for their increased effectiveness. Coyote studies. The coyote and its potential impact on eastern deer herds remains a big concern among biologists with 7 of the 33 presentations, or 21%, focused on coyotes. According to the University of Georgia graduate student Joseph W. Hinton, rabbits, small mammals, and white-tailed deer represented about 90% of prey remains found in coyote scat. Birds, fruit, insects, and human refuse represented less than 8% of the remains found in scat. White-tailed deer represented about 30% of the coyote coyote's diet, and deer were found to be consumed most during winter. Researchers also found that coyote weight and the season were important factors in a coyote's diet. The positive relationship between coyote consumption of deer and coyote body weight implies that body size is important for coyotes to acquire deer. However, it's important to recognize that coyotes seldom hunt alone, but in packs, which might eclipse the importance of individual predator size when adult deer are targeted. Do penned deer pay? Historically, the release of wild deer by state agencies played a significant role in aiding extremely low populations. However, some believe that the release of penned deer, especially bucks with highly desirable antlers, could augment desirable traits in herds in which less than desirable antler traits are the norm. Steve Damaris of Mississippi State University and his associates investigated the impact of releasing pen raised bucks to increase antler size in wild deer populations. The researchers reported on the results 10 years after the release of the deer. The study indicated that a replacement rate of 5% of the population, 100 pen raised deer, increased the Boone and Crockett score by only 0.8 inches. With 500 pen raised released deer in a free ranging population, which was a 25% replacement rate, the Boone and Crockett score was elevated by an average of 12 inches. Releasing pen raised deer into a confined herd was twice as effective as releasing them into open range as a replacement rate of only 10%, which was 200 deer, elevated the score in the penned area by 12 inches. Based on an assumed average of $2,792 for the cost of a fawn, the cost per increase of one inch of antler was $115,000 in a free-ranging population and $56,000 in a fenced herd. Although the characteristics of some penned deer, particularly their antlers, are extremely attractive to some sportsmen, Release programs would be cost prohibitive for state agencies and the public. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. And without further ado, here is Shane Mahoney. Shane Mahoney, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well. Nice to be here. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. We've been wanting to talk to you for some time. You actually came highly requested. I don't know if I shared that with you in the pre-chat, but there are uh, several of our listeners uh, wanted us to interview you, and uh, we finally were able to put something together. So thank you for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure on our end. Great. Great. I look forward to our call and our discussion here. Very nice. So, Shane, you are known for your conservation efforts, and you know conservation in deer hunting, as we like to discuss, is uh, it's a big part of it. It's a huge part of it. I would like to get some of your perspectives on that, but first, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you from? Well, <clears throat> I'm uh, 
I'm a Newfoundlander. I was born and raised uh, on the island of Newfoundland, which probably explains more about me than almost anything else. Uh, my mother was Irish. Uh, my father a Newfoundlander. Um, she was straight from Ireland. And um, I grew up in a uh, extraordinarily wild and beautiful place um, where weather really did make a difference in your life uh, that you couldn't escape from and where people lived very close to the land. It was a hunting and, and fishing culture and a fishing culture in terms of you know our industry, in terms of people's basic livelihoods. Um, we raised animals. You know, horses and goats and pigs and sheep and chickens were as much part of my childhood as, as other human beings. Um, and uh, the physical power of the place, surrounded by the Northwest Atlantic, um, you know, really, I think, had a, a great influence upon me. Um, it made me uh, fascinated with the, the natural environment because you were out in it all the time. Um, you know, we didn't get buses to school. We walked, you know, it was the typical kind of experience for somebody who grew up at that time mm. in a rural community. And uh, I developed a very early, deep fascination with with animals of all kinds, from insects through to domestic animals to birds, fish, whales, seabirds. And uh, that stayed with me my entire life, still is with me, and it led me into the career of, of biology. I, I'm a wildlife researcher primarily by education and, and profession. I went on eventually to become chief of wildlife research for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador and then a director for sustainable development and science. Um, established a, my own institute here or an institute of the government, but I established it at the university and uh, then went on from there to you know, do a lot of uh, very intensive long-term field work looking at the predator-prey relationships between black bears, mm -hmm. and coyotes, and lynx, and caribou, and moose, that kind of system. And, uh, you know, did the normal kinds of things that a scientist does. I published a great deal in the scientific literature, book chapters, monographs, all these kinds of things. But I also, of course, developed a, uh, um, a great uh, passion for and commitment to hunting, recreational hunting and fishing, and uh, not only saw uh, the connections between those activities and the conservation of wildlife from a sort of an academic or an intellectual perspective, but I grew up in a culture where the lives and deaths of animals very, very strongly influence the lives and families and communities uh, of the human beings I, I shared the island with. And uh, you know, after a long stint with, with government, I left and I have formed my own organization, Conservation Visions, and I have expanded my uh, efforts to work on wildlife conservation issues around the world. I serve as um, vice global chair for sustainable use for the World Conservation Union and as international liaison for our own wildlife society here in Canada and the United States. A North American expert to the International Council for Wildlife based in Budapest. Um, and uh, I spend a large part of my time now building coalitions for wildlife. Um, I'm uh, the executive director for a new institute in Colorado, uh, the High Lonesome Institute, which I am helping to f uh, found, which is funded primarily by, by private funding uh, there, by private landowners. Um, and of course, I write for magazines. I've hosted various television shows, The World of Sports, The Field, Loopholes, Big Game Profiles, um, Boone and Crockett Country for a number of years. I write for five or six different magazines uh, and I lecture and have my own podcast, been, you know, film system and work with BBC, National Geographic, um, all of those organizations. So my whole life really has been centered around wild creatures. I am uh, totally in love with them. I'm not afraid to say that. Um, they fascinate me. I absolutely believe they made all of us human. Without them, we wouldn't have known what human meant. Um, and for me, they have given me more joy and fascination in my life than, than any other single thing. Um, and so I, I, feel it's a, I feel it's a noble responsibility to, to work very hard to keep them with us. And as all of us know, that is becoming a more and more difficult thing uh, in greater and greater uh, parts of the world. Um, and it's going to take the very best in all of us to be able to keep mm. wildlife with us in this 21st century. Did, did you know as a child that this is the direction you wanted to go? Or was it more of Absolutely. a... You did. Okay. 
Yeah, no, there was never any doubt whatsoever. And, uh, you know, uh, my parents have told you that, uh, uh, you know, to some extent it was concerning because as even as a very, very young boy, I mean, you know, four or five years of age, you have to remember now we had total freedom in these communities. But even at that age, I would be gone, you know, by myself. You know, I mean, they'd be searching for me all the time. This was a regular (laughs) drama in our house, you know, because... And it's just... um, no, there was never any doubt. I was encouraged to go into law and medicine. I was academically very strong. Um, you know, I won lots of things. And uh, so lots of kind people advised, you know, that somebody with my uh, inclination or my uh, abilities, whatever, should pursue some career like that. But there was only ever one career for me, and that was to work with animals. And fortunately, you know, I spent a large percentage of my adult life, let alone as a child, but a very large percentage of my adult life with them. And I mean with them. Yeah. In, in totally wilderness areas and uh, often by myself. And uh, and in that sense, you know, it's kind of like being a professional athlete or a professional musician. You don't really have to grow up <laughs> right. to do the same thing as an adult as you were doing as a kid and as a teenager. So, uh, no, there was never any doubt. Well, there's some benefits to that for sure, but being able to just experience what you might consider your childhood forever. There's nothing wrong with that. That's kind of neat. No, uh, yeah, it's it's fantastic actually, and of course, the amazing thing about uh, wildlife is, um, particularly if you're interested in all kinds, um, you'll never run out of lessons. I mean, you, you you hardly ever. I mean, any experienced hunter will tell you this. You know, you <clears throat> you can't predict one day from the next. Right. If either on a particular hunt or between hunts over various years or fishing trips or whatever. I mean, it's always totally different. There are always surprises, and animals will always do things that you just do not expect. I mean, it's yep. no matter how well you know them. You know, they'll, I mean, it's, it's, it's an unending, it's like a, a tremendous book or a tremendous play or, uh, you know, a, a, a magnificent song that, that never gets boring. It's always changing. I was just going to ask, does it ever get boring? And again, it doesn't sound like it does. It sounds like it's uh, endless fun for you. Well, I mean, I think that uh, you have to remember now that a lot of what I do in the last uh, five to ten years has been, um, I guess, less uh, field uh, research-oriented, less with animals and a lot more with people as I try to bring my experiences um, to bear on shaping policies and bringing people together over wildlife. Um, To be totally honest with you, I don't enjoy that nearly as much as... (laughs) Spending the days with 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 uh, wild creatures, nothing against humans, but we're fairly brilliant, <laughs> right. uh, and uh, and we don't live in as nice a places as those animals do. That's a good point. So, uh, you know, but um, but it has to be done. I mean, it, it's important work. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if you ever felt like there was a duty associated with this to the point where it feels like work, and it, and it sounds like more or less the, the it's the human aspect that becomes the duty the the wildlife aspect is the fun yeah i mean wildlife interactions are basically you know kind of not only painless but they actually you know they actually you know suffocate any of the normal tensions and concerns people have right. i mean everybody who hunts experiences this right you know you can have an individual who's got facing you know any kind of challenges personal financial uh, career i mean you know but you know, a day or two into, and certainly into a significant hunt. And, you know, this begins to fall away. I mean, wilderness and wild places, nature does that anyway. But hunters obviously have a lot of deep experiences in in those circumstances. And everybody knows that this is true. This is part of what draws us back to hunting, of course, is this sense of escape. Right. You know, you really do. You, You end up living much more like an animal, which means that you live in the moment. And that's all that's I mean, that's consuming you, what's happening in that moment. And uh, that's part of the reason why intense athletics uh, draws so much to it, right? because everything else is put aside. Yeah. it's uh, What do they call that? Being in the zone, I think, is what, what they refer to it as. Mm-hmm. Now, is there a... I mean, we've, I've read some things and, and that there is a North American conservation model out there. And I was wondering if you could kind of walk us through where how that developed the kind of the history behind it and where we are today well first of all the term itself um north american model 
did not exist. A lot of people think it sort of always existed, but they, I know the history. I was intimately associated with it. The term itself did not exist before. Was never, you could never see it in print until 1988. Um, but the term, of course, only refers to something that existed for a longer period of time that we never called anything, really. We just lived with it. But essentially what it refers to is the system of policies and laws and institutions, funding mechanisms, all of those things that we have created in North America that make the North American approach to wildlife conservation unique. Now, conservation is a complicated business and it has a lot of players and a lot of parts. Some of them are very preservationist and are necessary. Some of them are very utilitarian and are necessary. And the North American model refers most especially uh, to the sustainable use model. In other words, the, the hunting and uh, fishing and recreational utilization of animals. When we entered the 20th century in Canada and the United States, um, we had come through a period of rapid colonization and expansion of settlement, obviously, in both countries, the building of the railways, the rise of large European-based, uh, immigrant-based uh, cities, we, we had displaced most of the Native American peoples, uh, not the best chapter in our lives or our history, uh, but uh, that was a fact that had happened. And along the way, we slaughtered wildlife. I mean, we remember the passenger pigeon and the bison, you know, things right. of this nature. But what most people don't realize, including a lot of people who are critical of hunting and angling today, or certainly critical of hunting, is that um, at the early part of the of the 20th century, if the United States had had an Endangered Species Act or Canada had had one, um, we would have listed, you know, the pronghorn antelope. We would have listed the black bear in certain parts of its range. We certainly would have uh, listed elk. We would have listed mule deer. Um, we would have listed wild turkey. We would have listed whitetails. We would have listed muleys. Um, we would have listed most of the the, the species that today we identify as primary game or, you know, wildlife to be hunted species. And, you know, what people have to ask themselves is how did we go from a circumstance where we had been decimated to a circumstance today, 2016, where we have certainly super abundant deer populations in some parts of our countries. You know, we have deer in our gardens. We have turkeys in our driveways. We have black bears in our orchards. We have geese, you know, you know, um, playing a different kind of game on our golf courses. Right. Um, you know, we have all of this richness in wildlife. And over that time period, the population of Canada and the United States has just increased at a phenomenal rate. The, you know, the change in habitats has, in, has proceeded at a phenomenal rate. Agricultural expansion, industrial expansion, all those things. We have enough firepower, you know, firearms in Canada and the United States in particular to eliminate every creeping, crawling, flying thing that is, 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 on our, is in our two countries. And yet we have this amazing abundance. You know, it didn't happen by accident. And the North American model refers essentially to the fact that it was not accidental. Well, there was a few things that worked for us. You know, there's a few habitat-related things that simply happened. But overall, it was because we brought in laws that controlled Mm -hmm. and used regulated hunting and angling as a major way of incentivizing people to look after wildlife. Um, we, we, use, we developed laws for the proper enforcement of wildlife. We created wildlife science and the science of wildlife management. When Aldo Leopold wrote that book in 1933, there was never any book before it that looked like it. It was a completely novel exercise. Um, you know, we gave birth to this wide group of NGO you know, that NGOs that help support all of this activity. Um, we essentially brought in an entire system, state agencies, federal agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, the state wildlife agencies, and so on and so forth. You know, these things were all created. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't exist, and they didn't have to exist. They created because purposeful people, largely influenced by the hunting and angling community, the utilitarian community, for a very long period of time in the 20th century, you know, gave rise to them. They volunteered for them. They paid money to them. They, they lobbied political authorities to get the right rules and regulations in place. They came up with the taxation systems like the Pittman-Robertson taxes and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, the Wallop Row on, you know, hunting equipment and boating equipment and so on. 
And so the North American model, most simply, while we identify principles within it, most simply what it's referring to is really that entire system that we brought together. And is it unique? Yes, it is. There is no other place in the world that has exactly our model. No place in Europe, no place in Africa, no, you know, no place in Asia, no place in South America. We simply have this unique model. And one of the strongest aspects of our model um, is the fact that it was democratic. And, and that made perfect sense in the context of these two new countries, and particularly in the case of the United States of America, that Canada moved away from Britain in a peaceful way. Obviously, right. the United States moved away from Britain during the Revolutionary War. Right. And um, so, the, but, so we developed this very uh, freedom-based system where everybody could have access to wildlife as long as they you know, were legal, of course, and as long as they could become proficient in the use, uh, in terms of recreational hunting, in the use of, of firearms. And this is a really interesting issue because, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy, obviously, around, around you know, firearms usage, um, gun violence. You know, the, I, mean, I mean, there are, there are real social concerns, and they're legitimate, obviously. No one likes to see the events that transpire. But, you know, one of the things that the legality of owning personal firearms in both countries made possible was this North American model, this approach to wildlife rescue, mm -hmm. because recreational hunting became a cornerstone of bringing back those big species, you know, the big charismatic species like the whitetail and like the moose and like the black bear and like sure. the wild and so on. And of course, when you brought those back, you, you did it by protecting habitat that benefited all kinds of wildlife, not just huntable wildlife. Um, and you couldn't have done that uh, in countries where, you know, personal citizen-based firearm ownership was permitted and was viewed as a right and, and as well as a privilege. And this, I'm not trying to take away from the intense debates over, you know, violence or things of this nature. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a complex question. But in terms of our discussion here, it's really important, and many people miss this point, that without Second Amendment rights, as you have them in the United States, we don't quite have that written in the same way in Canada. Our laws and policies are a little different, but we still have the right, you know, to have access to personal firearms. Without that, uh, this system of conservation could never, ever, ever have evolved. And while that system, you know, began in the early part, the latter part of the 1900s, the early part of the 20th century, yeah. to this day, 2016, in your country, in the United States of America, you know, about a good approximation is that about 70% of the budgets required by state agencies in your country is still, 70% is still fundamentally obtained, you know, acquired through uh, the activities of recreational hunters and, and, uh, and anglers. And, of course, shooters contribute a lot, too, because of the Pittman Robertson funding. That's a pretty phenomenal thing. We're talking something that has been evolving and developing, but has stayed in place for a, for a century now. You know, this is no splash in the pan. Right. And as I said, we, of course, we have challenges with wildlife in some places, and we've had, we have challenges with various endangered species. But overall, the so-called game populations, the hunted species are still existing in incredible numbers in our two countries. And when you think that every year, 14 million Americans and about a million Canadians, every year go afield to harvest wildlife, and if you add fishermen and, and fisher persons into this, that's another you know, 30 to 35 million participate in this activity and have been doing so for, for a century, ever since we brought in game laws you know, and, and, and structured things and came up with quotas and permits and license fees and enforcement officers and all this. We've been doing this for, for, for you know, for over a century. Hmm. Um, and it's worked brilliantly. And so the North American model is, is all of that. Um, now, there are other aspects to conservation in North America that don't derive directly from hunting and angling. And we need to be the first ones to point this out. You know, the national parks are not primarily driven by you know, our, our sustainable use policies. Um, we have um, lots of things like national forests in the United States. You know, there's many, many things that contribute to wildlife conservation that are not fundamentally hunting and angler based, but a significant, a truly significant part of it in both of our countries rest on the shoulders, the contributions, the volunteerism, the political agitation, the, uh, 
the, the general sense of responsibility that uh, that hunters and anglers have developed over over several generations towards wildlife in both our countries. Wow. What what are some of the the biggest challenges for conservationists today? Well, you know, if you look at it from a from a sort of global perspective, or even if you try to bring it into the context of, of Canada and the United States. I mean, obviously, human population growth and human mm-hmm. demands are really, you know, the ultimately the biggest issue. Um, we have seven point something billion people on the planet now, and the predictions are we will reach eight and quite likely nine, and some say we'll reach 10. I mean, can you imagine? It's hard to imagine another three billion people on this small ball that spins around on right. its axis, you know. Right. But nevertheless, those are the predictions. And you know, everywhere wildlife is getting squeezed out. I mean, the problems with African wildlife that we hear about most, and I, you know, I spend a lot of time with these issues these days, such as, you know, elephant poaching or rhino slaughters and things of this nature. They're the huge big issues that we see, lion declines or, you know, the killing, hunting of lions, etc. But, you know, on that continent, the massive numbers of people who require simple basics in life of food, security, you know, warmth, um, appraising, you know, just just unbelievable demands on the landscapes. And, and wildlife must go in the face of that, particularly if, if that process is not structured. We're very fortunate that we have the institutions and policies and laws and governance structures and accountability and legalities and legitimacies that we do in both of our countries. But, you know, you get on any aircraft today, and fly from, let's say, New York to San Francisco and, you know, just sit by the window and look down at the country that you're flying over. And you, you, you get a good picture of just how much of it has been subjugated now to human pressure and how much has been taken over, not necessarily just by cities or towns or roads, but by, you know, agriculture and other industrial activity. So this is a, this is a basic huge challenge. But the, the human challenge that we face is not just our numbers. The, the big problem we have is that too few people really care. I mean, you know, we, we need to find a way to make every single citizen of the United States and Canada concerned about the issues that the three of us are talking about here this evening. You know, we need to, we need to have – this ought to be something that is not left to, you know, the, the, the podcast host or, you know, the Shane Mahoney's of the world. Sure. I mean, this, this needs to become everybody's business, everybody's problem everybody's responsibility. And um, I I think the fact that too few people care is our second biggest problem. And I think our third biggest problem is that of those that do care, um, we're divided, you know, Uh, Mm. you know, we're divided within our communities, like we're divided, say, take the hunting community, you know, we got divisions within it. Um, Then between the hunting and angling communities, we got certain different perspectives, and then between hunters and anglers and non-hunters, there's, you know, there's, there's different perspectives. And then between those and people who are vehemently opposed to hunting, anti-hunters, there's different perspectives. But you know what? I mean, <laughs> wildlife really doesn't give a damn about our perspectives. That's true. I mean, um, we, you know, we have simply got to grow up um, and, and realize that even if we don't like one another, even if we cannot begin to fathom how one another feel about this, that we all want clean water, we all want healthy forests, we all want wildlife to be healthy and secure, um, you know, we want clean air, you know, we want to be able to experience nature in, in its real form, not just in a zoo or, a, you know, a, a manicured little game park or something. I mean, you know, we want songbirds in our lives. Um, and, uh, we better learn within the next 10 to 20, 30 years on this planet, uh, to get a grip on those things that, that, that we share as human beings, regardless of race, color, religion, uh, you know, or whether one hunts or does not hunt or, I mean, you know, conservation has become an extraordinarily practical business. And it's fine for people to have ideological positions. Oh, I don't support that. And I won't support this. And I won't support the other thing. But, you know, if we put wildlife at the center of this, put them at center stage, ask them what they want. You know, as Teddy Roosevelt said, they cannot speak for themselves. So we will. So let's imagine that they're there on this platform and you ask them, what do you want? Well, what do they want? They want the same as a human being wants, really. They want food. They want security. They want to reproduce and... You know, I mean, these are basic things, and we end up 
to some extent denying that to wildlife by the fact that we can't find a way, uh, you know, to get along. It's like, you know, um, it's easy for me to sit here in St. John's, Newfoundland, for example, and say, oh, I think people should tolerate African lions around their communities. That's pretty easy for me to say. Right. You know, I don't, I don't go out and get water in a bucket from the river and wonder if the next thing I'm going to feel are, you know, uh, four-inch canines going through my spine. Sure, right. So, you know, it's, it's kind of easy. I mean, a lot of the people who oppose, you know, various activities and want all this wildlife to be running around, they won't tolerate a mouse or a cockroach in their home without calling, you know, some army of exterminators. Right. You know, we've got to realize that we've got to take a bigger view of all of this. And, and, and we have to find this way, as I said, to make more people, more people care, and then to make those people who care sit down together and say, look, you can't stand hunting. I understand that. I am very passionate about it. You have to understand that. You don't have to like it. You don't have to ever want to do it. But the bottom line here is we have these this wildlife over here. Now, how are we going to pay for its management? How are we going to pay for its protection? How are we going to look after the problems of disease transmission between wildlife and humans, which is becoming an increasing problem? We ought to remember that AIDS came to us that way. We ought to remember that there's all kinds of viral transmissions going on now that we all know about right. uh, transmitted that come from animals. Like, Who's going to deal with all of that? This is a practical business. And uh, I don't have time for ideologues anyway. I never have. <laughs> gotcha. uh, I mean, life life is just too complicated. And if you live in you live in nature, you pretty well realize that you really don't have it figured out, no matter how much you think you do. Right. So that, that's what I think are our biggest challenges. Okay. So, so based off of some of the the divides, the the lines between the hunter and the non-hunter, or the lines between the hunter and the hunter, one of the things that I've recognized is that the non-hunter although maybe not anti-hunter, but non-hunter, often have this predetermined feeling about the trophy. And I have friends of mine who just realized that I hunted, period, have come up to me and said, well, that's, I'm okay if you hunt, but you're not trophy hunting, right? And, and it, I just have this opinion on it. I was wondering what you felt about the trophy. Well, I've dealt a lot with this issue because um, a couple of years ago in this group, the World Conservation Union that I work with, we came up with the trophy hunting guidelines uh, for the world, essentially, that have now been adopted by most countries, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and others. Mm -hmm. And I have so been heavily involved in the debates and the discussions over trophy hunting. And there's a couple of things that I can say, you know, that I feel pretty confident in. Number one is that most people uh, misunderstand the term. Um, but number two, that regardless of that, we have over 40 years of public opinion survey in the United States alone that indicates that if if you ask people, they will say they do not support trophy hunting. You know, they'll, they'll support meat hunting, just as you've said, and mm -hmm. hunting generally, but they will not support. That's not a new phenomenon. That goes back over 40 years of public opinion surveys. Okay, interesting. But but, uh, but as I say, and in, and, and in America, and in fact, if you ask a lot of hunters, it's not just non-hunters who have a concern about it. If you ask a lot of hunters, hunters. The, the, the whole trophy hunting name has become tension-filled and problematic. And unfortunately, you know, it's the name, it's the term, because people then jump from the term trophy. And, you know, we use that term today for trophy cars, trophy wives, trophy, you know, we use it in a, we, we kind of use it in a bit of a pejorative sense, you know, in a larger context. But they take that term and then they ascribe a certain motivation to the person. So they say the person who, in quotation marks, trophy hunts is a person who's simply motivated to be a big shot. You know, they have the big eagle and they want to hang it on the wall. But what they forget are all the combinations. So, you know, I travel rural Newfoundland and I see a fisherman out on the, his wharf mending his nets and I go out to talk to him. I look up on his shed where he keeps his nets and there's a moose skull, mm. you know, whitened by sea salt and spray nailed to that, that shed with a, you know, an eight inch nail hardly a trophy room of a, of, a, of, a, of a gentleman, you know what I mean? Sure. And I, I, I say to him, Skipper, what, what's that up there? He got there, oh, well, no. And then he launches into a story about maybe he and his brother went, and, or he and his grandson went, or whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, he relives that, that memory by virtue of seeing what he has. And in a sense, that to him is his trophy. 
A uh, trophy can be something that reminds us of the hunt. I mean, a trophy can be can be a photograph. I mean, a trophy can be antlers. I mean, a trophy can be the hide of an animal. The trophy, to me, in a lot of cases, is the meat uh, from the animal. You know, it's a, it's a remembrance right. thing. Right. Uh, unfortunately, regardless of all of this, and it's a very complicated question, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the term has now become corrupted to the extent that I do not believe it's salvageable. Hmm. Um, if you travel to Europe, and I've been just recently back from meetings there at the European Parliament and Cambridge University where we were doing some things, you know, it is just blanketly true that people have a deeply ingrained sense in opposition to trophy hunting as they interpret it. And we have two choices as a hunting community. This is my personal opinion. Okay. We can try to mount a some kind of massive communication plan, which people think is the solution, which really means that we have to essentially get into the minds of people all over the world now, from Africa to Europe to North America, including in our own hunting communities in Canada and the United States. And we have to exhume, we have to take out, dig out of their minds, all of that misinformation, all of that you know, understanding that they have developed over their lifetimes and suddenly replace it with a very complicated story of exactly what trophy hunting might mean. I might be a hunter who will only take a certain animal, you know, that, so in other words, I'm limiting my, my opportunity and I'm a trophy hunter. I might be somebody who, as I said, wants to have a memento of my hunt and I have a choice to shoot a smaller animal or a bigger animal, so I shoot the bigger animal, am I really a trophy hunter? You know, there's so many combinations. We've got to go back and try to explain all of that to a public that has its mind made up. Or we can do what I have suggested that we should be doing always. We should never use an adjective with hunting. We shouldn't call it meat hunting. We should not call it trophy hunting. We should not call it recreational hunting. We should not call it sport hunting. We should call it hunting. Hmm. Period. Because we also know, based on these opinion surveys, <clears throat> that if you ask people, do they support trophy hunting? Very low, 22% of the American population. If you ask them if they support legal fair chase meat hunting, you got about 75 to 80% of the people. You ask them about even recreational hunting, and the support falls. You ask them about sport hunting, and it falls quite far. It doesn't go as far as trophy hunting, but it falls quite far. These adjectives stir up very complicated responses in the public mind. In many cases, they're not solid understandings. They're not based on fact, but they are deeply, deeply ingrained. The person who responded to the survey 40 years ago was 20 years of age. Hmm. That person hypothetically also responded to the latest survey 40, you know, 40 years later. They're now 60. Right. And they're still feeling the same way. Do we really think that very many people who didn't support trophy hunting when they were 20 or didn't really like the word, you know, sport hunting when they were 20 suddenly at the age of 60 are now saying, yeah, I think those terms are great. Of course not. That's not what's happening. And the whole backlash against hunting, you know, is being um, made worse and being fueled largely by this this term. Um, and so my advice is simply stop using Simply stop using all these adjectives. Yeah. Try to get away from using these terms. I'm a hunter. And, every, you know, we have 14 million hunters in the United States and a million in Canada. And so when people ask me, well, what's the motivation for hunting? You know, what, what do these people have as a motivation for hunting? I say, well, actually, there's 15 million motivation because every single one of those individuals is going to have some different They'll share some things, but there'll be some will emphasize one thing, some will emphasize another. Right. When we first saw on the island of Newfoundland, American and Canadian uh, hunters coming to our island to hunt moose, we have a lot of moose here. Right. And, uh, and Newfoundlanders have always called moose antlers their horns. So they say big set sure. of horns. Yeah, antlers. right. Yep. That's is our local, local term. I mean, I can remember hearing the, the you know, people were just incredible that, um, you know, people would come and would really value the horns because we we grew up in a total meat hunting culture. Now, that didn't mean that we didn't like the, the, we did not like the sight of a beautiful big bull or that if we had an opportunity, we probably wouldn't harvest him over, you know, a smaller little character. Right. But we just, we just, we just didn't have that 
valuation. We were fascinated to know that people really were <laughs> into the horns in, 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 in that kind of a way. So our motivations were, were different, you know, uh, but the people who came to hunt, they often wanted the meat as well. Right. Right. So some people might say that sure. that new meat hunter, he's a perfect guy. Well, yeah, but he didn't really want to use the antlers. But this other hunter who came from Connecticut or Ontario or wherever, um, he not only took the meat, but he also wanted to take the antlers. You know, it's so complicated. I mean, it's just, it's too complicated. And people, people have approached me and said, if we had, you know, five or $10 million, would you help lead this kind of a campaign? I said, absolutely not. By a campaign, they mean a campaign to sort of, you know, re-explain the word trophy. Right. Because I just honestly, truthfully, I don't believe it can be done. And I don't think the adjectives help us. I don't think sport hunting helps us. I don't think trophy hunting helps us. I don't think recreational hunting helps us. We should just say that we hunt. And this term sport, by the way, to give you an idea how the idea changes, that term was introduced to North America by European shooters. Okay. And the term sport was meant to be to describe not the kind of hunting, but the kind of hunter. He's a good sport right? because he hunts by fair chase. He won't shoot the birds on the water. You know, he's got a, he's got a stylistic, a ritual kind of set of standards, which eventually became the fair chase standard okay. in North America. And then suddenly over time, this sport, the individual, you know, Jay is a good sport because he hunts this way, got modified to talk about sport hunting as a kind of a class of hunters and then eventually the term just rolled on from there. Interesting. So oh. now some people in society hear that and they say, well, if you want sport, why don't you shoot a few hoops? Why do you have to kill an animal? <laughs> right. Huh? right. 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 That's yeah. It. Go shoot some hoops. Yeah. That's, uh, that's fascinating. I was just about to ask you, like, what are the origins of the, these adjectives that we've somehow slapped onto the, the word hunting uh, that, that explains some of that? Very interesting. Yeah. I have another topic I wanted to just pick your brain about specifically sure. because it came up during an interview that we did with somebody from the South that is engaged in high fence hunting. And right. it caused some controversy. It, uh, it definitely showed a line of or a division between hunter and hunter. And it, uh, but I think it's important to talk about what is your position as a conservationist when it comes to high fence hunting? Well, first thing you got to remember about uh, high fenced hunting is um, that if there wasn't a demand for it, it wouldn't be there. Right. And where's the demand coming from? It's obviously coming from the hunting community. Right. Now, the hunting community is a complicated beast, right? It has many different kind styles and subgroups and little tribes and so on. And that's the way we're made. Um, but that's an important point that we shouldn't forget. The, the, the hunt, the, the high fence hunting, the hunting behind high fences would, would not be there except there is a market essentially for it that, and, and hunters want it. Um, I have great concerns about uh, the extreme aspects, particularly that are associated with it. When I see white-tailed deer that can't lift their heads practically because they have antler masses on them the size of elk, sure. I'm, not in, I'm not in favor of that. I'm just personally not in favor of it. I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing for those animals, and I don't think it's a good thing for the image of hunting. And frankly, I, I, just, I just don't support that. Yep. On the other hand, if you go back to a circumstance where you know you examine the land base in the United States of America, um, more than about 52 percent, probably a little more, but certainly around that number uh, percentage of the land in your country is privately owned. Right. Now we have spent the better part of this past century, the 20th, you know, trying to figure out how to do better conservation on public lands. Right. It was only in the last couple of decades that we started to really focus on private lands, which we're focusing on a lot more today in this century, because we realized that that's an enormous issue. How wildlife gets treated and managed on private lands is a critical issue facing wildlife conservation. Aldo Leopold grappled with this issue in the 1930s and, you know, eventually came to the conclusion that the private landowner has to be incentivized to, to tolerate, maintain, enhance uh, wildlife on their lands. There has to be something that comes back to that private citizen to do that kind of thing. And 
part of what has emerged in states like Texas, for example, where 95, 94, 95 percent of the land is privately owned, is that people have developed fences around properties in part to control movement of animals in and out and also control the movement of people in and out and so on. And these estates, these ranches have evolved to become places where there's a lot of hunting activity. So within that realm, you would go all the way from a circumstance where animals are intensively bred, they're virtually habituated to human beings, Mm -hmm. they're fed constantly, their diet is prescribed to create, in particular, massive animals with massive antlers and so on at a very young age, Right. Um, all the way to a circumstance where, you know, you may be out hunting uh, in a fenced area and hardly know, hardly be able to tell the difference between it and if you were in an unfenced area. Right. So there are a lot of gradations in what we're calling, you know, fenced hunting. Now, usually when people say high fenced hunting, they mean, you know, relative, they, they're often referring to, not always, but they're often referring to quite confined circumstances. And they're often referring to those circumstances of extremism, very smaller areas, highly manipulated wildlife, people paying, you know, fortunes to get a particular breeding buck to come in and out, sperm columns costing a fortune and artificial incentive. I mean, some of it is taken to absolute extremes. And that's often what people are thinking about. I am not in favor of those kinds of things, those extremes. But I find it difficult to throw it all in a bag and say, oh, I don't support any of that. Because as I said, and I agree with Leopold, we have to find a way to, to, to incentivize the private landowner to keep wildlife on their lands. Some private landowners will be content to just have the wildlife. Some private landowners will want to realize benefits from that wildlife, either to hunt themselves or allow their families and friends to hunt. Some will want to realize more of a, uh, an advantage by creating economic opportunity for themselves. You know, our problem, I think, is that we, just as many other things in society, it is very hard to find that absolutely perfect line. You know, it's like long distance shooting. What is long distance? When does it become a long distance shot? And again, I don't like ideologues, as I've said. Right. My own my own position is I'm, I'm not about to throw out the all hunting behind fences as 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 a blight on the land because I do not believe that. I do believe that private landowners and private property rights matter. I do believe that we have to bring that private uh, land to only community on site for conservation. It's it, it has to be done. I do believe that landowners who you know do good things for wildlife that that benefit us all, um, you know that that improve their 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 lands for wildlife and all of those things. I think they need to be incentivized some way, and I think hunting on those private lands is one way. And I believe we we should be tolerant of that and protect that. Okay. But I am not tolerant of these uh, of these extremes. I just think they uh, I, I think that they're just not the right thing to do. And I do believe that they that those extremes are hurting us in the broad hunting community. Okay, very very good. Now, Shane, one of the things that we request on the show is that we we like to hear a good deer hunting story from time to time, or even just a hunting story. And as a conservationist, I would assume that you're also a hunter. Uh, it seems to go hand in hand. And I was wondering if you could take us on a play-by-play deer hunting experience, a memorable one for you, and, and share with that share that story with us. Well, I think, um, of course, coming from Newfoundland, we, we, don't have, we don't have deer. We have moose, but we don't right. have deer. But I have, I have hunted deer in a number of of different states um, and in British Columbia. Okay. Do you have one? Uh, but I think the, I think the most memorable uh, experience I had, though, was um, I was actually on an elk hunt in the, in the Bob Marshall uh, in Montana. And um, um, I also had uh, a mule deer permit. Um, and okay. um, we were, uh, I was successful in, in getting my elk. But um, this was a horseback hunt, obviously. It was in uh, October. There was lots of snow. It was, it was marvelous, challenging. Uh, the company of a lot of great people from the uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and uh, some really good outfitters. And it was pure wilderness and, you know, tent camps and this kind of thing. And so extremely enjoyable. Up 
were light and on your horse before light broke and gradually, you know, seeing the world come alive from the back of this big warm beast that's underneath you. It's uh, the smell of them. And I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty spectacular. In the evening time, um, when we would come back and get somewhat nearer to camp, sometimes we we'd sort of split off from the various groups that we would ride out with and ride back with and sort of poke our own way back to the camp, you know. And uh, I was doing that. I, used to, I did that pretty well every evening, actually. But uh, this particular evening, beautiful fall, you know, there's some snow, but not a lot and, because we were in lower country and where the camp was. And uh, I was simply sort of sitting there um, scanning the country and looking. And then I kind of just got um, in that kind of sensory zone where I didn't really, I really wasn't looking all that hard. I was just sort of panoramically taking this in. And, um, and I was, I was really looking for deer at that point because, you know, uh, I, I had my elk and, uh, kind of just settled back and lay back. And I was looking at this absolutely glorious landscape that, you know, the, the dying sun, you know, this, this beautiful golden light sweeping across that land complete wilderness, you know, wolf tracks in the snow, mountain lion tracks, you know, it's just absolutely exquisite. And uh, suddenly I just, this this one moment, I just turned my head to the left and I was lying down now with my hands under my head, you know, I was hardly what you would call intensely hunting at that point. Uh, and these three magnificent mule deer just bounded up out of this gorge hurried by something. I thought for sure I was going to see wolves following them or something. But, you know, they just came up as they do with this kind of effortless, you know, lope and just bouncing and obviously excited by something and simply, you know, ran at an angle to the sun, catching its light and then turning towards it and going down to the darkness of the forest into the lower recesses there. And, uh, you know, I can remember that I, I I can see them now as, as, as clearly as if they walked into this room where I'm speaking, and it. So I, I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't even reach for my rifle. Um, I didn't. I don't have any. You know, drama about you know putting up, putting it to my shoulder and searching for right. it to go open. Well, any of that. But I would never ever have experienced that except I was hunting. Right. And that's that's the amazing thing. Um, I wouldn't have been in that country, most likely, except for the fact that I was hunting. Uh, I wouldn't have had those many different experiences I had in that 10 days. Um, But also, despite the fact that I was hunting, at that moment, that just exquisitely beautiful, you know, unbelievable, you know, image of these three magnificent animals just floating up into the sun and down, up into the sun and down, and then just disappearing down into the darkened timber below. Um, there, I actually had no motivation to reach for my life. And as a matter of fact, I'm glad I didn't at that particular point in time because maybe I would have been successful in taking one of those animals. But that full pageant, that full scene, uh, I would never have lived through. I would never have witnessed it. And I wouldn't trade that for I wouldn't trade that even for, you know, the experience of successfully harvesting one of them. So I think, to me, that was, uh, you know, that was probably, even though I didn't harvest an animal that time, and I have in other circumstances, um, that was probably, for deer, that was probably the most uh, inspiring experience hunting deer that I have personally had. There's there's no question that, and, and I've had experiences too, where some of the best hunts I've ever been on, are hunts where I never pulled the trigger, nor had the desire to at that very moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly true. Yep. Sean, what do you suggest as a average hunter here in the States that, that we can do and participate in to be better conservationists? Well, I think there's a lot of things, actually. Uh, I get asked that question by a lot of people when I come off the stage or whatever. Um, first thing is, you know, conservation is is a complicated business. It, you know, it always amazes me when people treat it as something simple. You know, a person would never tell a medical doctor what his job is. They'd never tell the architect in their home who designs their home. But they, everybody seems to feel that they can kind of design the, the conservation world. Well, conservation is the intersection of politics and biology and economics and human population growth and climate change and habitat loss and agriculture and loss of pollinators and all all those things pile into one. So 
So the first thing I tell people is you have to become knowledgeable. You have to read about this business. And you can get some of it from our magazines and periodicals that you get. But, you know, you need to know where this history comes from. You need to know about people like Theodore Roosevelt. You need to know about people like John Muir. You need to know about people like uh, George Bird Grinnell and Gifford Pinchot and Ding Darling and Aldo Leopold. I mean, you know, if you really want to say that you and you really want to contribute, the first thing you have to do to contribute to anything, building a boat, fixing a car, you know, uh, running a computer, you've got, you got to acquire knowledge. So the first thing is, you know, acquire knowledge. You don't have to beat yourself up over it, but, you know, learn about the important events that took place. Learn about why hunting is important for conservation. That's, that's number one. Number two, I think try to be tolerant. I mean, I really truly believe that, you know, if, if all sides in these debates don't try to develop some level of tolerance, uh, towards different viewpoints on these issues, then uh, I, I think we're doomed. But more importantly, wildlife is doomed. The third thing I think that people really need is they need to try to help one of the good organizations that are out there, maybe maybe more than one, but, but start with one. And I personally don't care whether it's the bee, you know, the, 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 the bee and butterfly alliance, or it's a, a hunting-based organization, or it's a you know, the uh, Habitat Preservation Organization. And if you're a hunter, find the hunting organization that best suits you in terms of the things you're most concerned about. So if you're concerned about habitat protection, look at one that focuses on that. If you're most concerned about, you know, mountain species, you know, find an organization that, that that, that, you know, works primarily for those particular animals. Find some organization that you can give some part of your life. And I don't expect people to give their lives as I have. I mean, people have different lives, but they can give a little bit of their life. They can give 1% of their life or 2% of their life or something of this nature. They should join an organization and support it. Um, and finally, um, I think, you know, we have 14 million hunters, as I've said, in, in the United States. We have a million in Canada. We have 30 you know, 30 million, perhaps as many as 30 million people who fish. Just imagine if half those people, imagine if 20 million people, imagine if 20 million people in a single year wrote one letter to their local newspaper in support of these ideas, in support of wildlife, in support of hunting, in support of angling. Right. And, and with knowledge, just wrote 250 words to say, I understand why you may be critical, but you should think about this. Or, you know, my father was a hunter and he stood for the following. Or it can be any angle whatsoever. You know, every single person has a voice. And the most beautiful thing about conservation, unlike um, computers or unlike being an architect or a medical doctor, every single person is able to contribute to conservation. Every single human being can do that. When I see elderly people in Newfoundland working in their gardens, men or men and women, you know, they're planting flowers or weeding, doing a bit of weeding, you know, I stop and talk to them and they don't think that they're supporting conservation, but they are. They're supporting conservation because they're making the world aesthetically more beautiful. Isn't that why we go to nature to find beauty? I mean, if it was ugly, would we go? Of course not. We wouldn't be there. Um, they're supporting conservation by supporting pollinators, you know, bees and wasps and flies, those little things that keep our fruits and vegetables in the world growing, <laughs> you know, are being enhanced by what these people are doing. They're, they're, they're doing things in the soil, they're digging, they're producing soil with the gardens they produce, which produce earthworms and, you know, give benefits to songbirds when they're feeding their chicks and raising their young. I mean, so, you know, just this little thing that these people are doing has a chain reaction in conservation. And every person can help. We can help clean up the environment. We can help protect the environment. We can speak for the environment. You know, we can organize something at our local pub. If a fellow likes to drink pints, they can have his conservation meeting at the local pub. I mean, if people right. are drinkers, they can find a place, a little cafe. Everybody can do something. And that's the very first thing. You know, the, the young hunter in particular should just sit down and say, I don't know what it is I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And within six months to a year of that, with a little bit of digging and fumbling around, he or she will find a place to settle, and the rewards to them will be enormous. People who join organizations or develop a little crusade of their own or, you know, look back after a few years on the efforts that they themselves have made to bring water guzzlers to mountain sheep or to 
you know, help tear down old fences that don't need to be there anymore or who make sure that, you know, uh, wildlife has proper over and underpasses or whatever on a highway. I mean, whatever the issue might be, when they look back on it, they'll feel a great sense of uh, a great sense of accomplishment. And so I really believe that every single every single person can be a part of this. And, you know, Roosevelt really strived to make conservation a part of citizenship in your country. Yep. And, and to an appreciable extent, he succeeded, or you wouldn't have what you have today. Um, and uh, I think that's a, that's a legacy and a message we need to carry forward, you know, yeah. encouraging everybody. I mean, people don't have to be hunters to be good conservationists, but that, but a lot of hunters are good conservationists. You know what I mean? Like, it's, right. it's about whether you become a hunter or don't become a hunter, you know? I mean, it's, it's about whether you care for wildlife, and, you, and yeah. you do it the best way you can. Shane, do you think that... I mean, this is a, a kind of a general question. Do you think conservation is in a, is in good shape right now? No, I don't. Okay. I don't think conservation is in good shape. I don't think uh, that's um, uh, and, and the reason I say that is that um, you know we to some extent we are carrying on um, you know the uh, we're living on the on the on the on the investment of others you know on the investment of the past. Um, we created all these great institutions, and these organizations, and these funding mechanisms, and so on. But, you know, as I pointed out earlier in the conversation, we have too few people who care. The people who care are divided, and we're running out of money. It takes a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Conservation, as I said, is a practical business. It takes a lot of money. And, um, you know, a big part of the money is paid for by the recreational sustainable use user, you know, the person who uses wildlife in that way, hunts and fishes. Those numbers are declining. Uh, in many areas, um, we don't have really good alternative funding sources, um, and we need them. Um, so I worry about the, you know, the future uh, of wildlife. Um, on this continent, we live in a dream. You know, Canada and the United States is right. just a dream. Travel anywhere in the world, you'll soon know we live in a dream. Right. We're wealthy. We're educated. We, we, we have everything that we want. We live in beautiful towns and cities and homes and. Uh, Wildlife is the teens. I mean, I live in Newfoundland. I can go watch whales tomorrow. I can go to seabird colonies. I can go into the interior and see caribou with their calves and tons of moose and black bears. And you know what I mean? Um, we're living in a dream, but it won't last. It's not an accident. We have to work for it. And um, I'm just concerned that uh, you know that we're we're not creating enough new people. Who are deeply concerned about this, um, and uh, I, I know what it's going to take to keep wildlife with us in this 21st century. It's it's a big bloody task. So okay. no, I, I am concerned about it. Okay, all right. What what are your biggest projects that you're working on right now? We talked a little bit in the pre-chat. What's tell us more about that project? The biggest one is the Wild Harvest Initiative. Um, about a year ago, I launched this project, and I have a lot of supporters, thankfully, from the conservation community and the, the hunting NGO community and also some from industry. Um, one of the things we need to do is to find a value for wildlife to make people care about it. Uh, one of the things we also need to do is to explain why hunting is relevant in a modern world. And both of those issues are important to me. And so I seek uh, efforts, projects, and so on that, uh, that dovetail those. And, I, and, and one that I've conceived and landed now and which is underway is what I'm calling the Wild Harvest Initiative, which um, is taking all of the harvest data from Canada and the United States by recreational you know, hunters uh, and fisher people, uh, fishers, anglers, um, and we're going to establish the, the biomass or the numbers of pounds, kilograms, the two countries use different metrics, um, of, of wild protein that's harvested by the 40 million people who engage in this every year, which you can certainly imagine is going to be a, a gargantuan figure. Um, white-tailed deer alone will be an absolutely massive figure. Mm. Um, secondly, I'm going to take that and, working with economists, develop a fair market value for all of that meat and fish. Thirdly, uh, I'm going to measure the what I call the sharing index you know, so we have, you know, 6%, let's say, of the people who hunt. And if we add people who fish, we're up to 12, 13%. But I can assure you that probably 30 to 40% of Canadians and Americans eat wild meat at some point each year mm-hmm. because of hunters sharing, sharing the harvest, hunters and anglers. 
So we're going to calculate that shearing index to see exactly how many Canadian and American citizens participate in the consumption of that harvested food. Um, and then uh, we're going to calculate what it would take to replace it. If all hunting and angling stopped tomorrow, how are we possibly going to replace the hundreds upon hundreds, the hundreds of millions, indeed the billions of pounds, which it is, billions of pounds, of wild organic food that is currently being produced through these sustainable systems. And we're going to point out that we this is the largest environmentally successful uh, food harvesting system in the world, and I believe it is. Right. And by doing that, we're going to point out that, first of all, wildlife has a value beyond the aesthetic. It is still an important food source, number one. And number two... We're going to make hunting relevant because we already have a locavore movement. We already have an organic meat movement. We don't need to create any kind of myth in society. All we have to do is explain, as my new next article in Sports Afield will, that hunters were the first locavores. And we are simply part of that community of mushroom harvesters and wild berry harvesters and wild fruit harvesters, you know, and who go out and take from nature the fruits and benefits of the land. Right. And we have a track record to prove we do it in a sustainable way. It has actually rescued wildlife. We disproportionately pay for conservation services in our state agencies, and we do not damage the environment. And so uh, this is a, a big project. It has a lot of supporters. We have state agencies in support of it now. We're working on provincial agencies. We have some industry and it's growing. We have quite a number of NGOs involved, the Wild Sheep Foundation, Dallas Safari Club, Safari Club International, Safari Club International Canada. Um, we have the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the U.S. Sportsman's Alliance, Quality Care Management, Whitetails Unlimited, the Guides and Outfitters of British Columbia, uh, the Northeast Michigan chapter of SCI, a lot of individual chapters, um, Leupold and Stevens, the Optic Company. You know, we have a a growing list and the state of, of, uh, of Florida is involved and, and the state of Texas is expressing very deep interest as are a number of other states. This is going to be a game changer because we are going to show that um, despite it being 2016, that we are actually harvesting in a renewable way an absolutely massive amount of totally organic, beautiful, healthy food for the citizens of our two countries. That sounds like an amazing project. If there's anything that we can do to become involved in that, the Count of Santa, it sounds exactly like the kind of things we want to explore here on our show. Well, I'll, t- well, I'll tell you, maybe in a, in a future casting, we can uh, just deal with that project separately in a, sure. in a, in a, in a fulsome way. Uh, it'd be a great help to us to have the opportunity to share it with your listeners. Definitely. Very good. All right, so I have 10 rapid-fire questions for you, Shane. I didn't prep you on these, and uh, but it's to get to know you a little bit better, like just your day-to-day life, see what you, what, what you think about. So mm-hmm. are you ready? Sure. Okay. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Be vigilant. I like it. All right, we all have these things that we carry into the woods with us. Maybe they're good luck charms. Maybe they're something else, but it drives us crazy if we forget them in the truck or at the camp when we're out in the field. What's that one thing for you? Well, it used to be a really old pair of boots, but they finally wore out to the point that I had to give them over. <laughs> so uh, that, <laughs> that's yep. the truth. I just had one pair that I just wore and wore and wore forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've uh, got a pair of boots just like that, and I still can't throw them away, even though I don't I, I don't use them anymore. I just like to look at them. Yeah, I did that for a while. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> Lots of memories in those boots. All right. Yeah. What uh, What's your biggest pet peeve? Um, people who preach yeah. at you. That's a really pet peeve of mine. Yeah. 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 I right. like people who listen and have a moderate discussion. Yeah. I agree with you on that one for sure. All right. How How old are you today, Shane? 59. 59. All right. Knowing what, and you, this might be just pretty clear cut, but knowing what you know today about life and conservation, what would you tell the 30-year-old Shane Mahoney? Um, I would have told him to do pretty much what he did, but the one thing that perhaps I would have said to do a little bit different is slow down just a little bit and constantly be vigilant, scan the environment, because you only have a certain amount of time and energy to give things, and you have to be careful about choosing the best things to give that time to. 
Right. Very good. All right. You're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and a complete stranger comes up to you in the lobby of the hotel and asks you, what do you do for a living? What do you say? I say I'm a conservationist. Excellent. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a uh, bowl of um, one of these super healthy cereals uh, filled added to by a pile of chia seeds. <laughs> <laughs> but I will hasten to add that while I might like to think that I do that all the time, yeah. <laughs> I don't. But that is what I had this morning. All right, we caught you on a good day. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I helped. Right. All right, you get your own billboard. It's a blank canvas. What do you put on the canvas? Wildlife cannot speak for themselves, so we must. Okay. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? I think Roosevelt is the first person that pops into my head because in in my field of endeavor, uh, it's hard to imagine the movement without him. Right. Definitely an implementer there, that's for sure. All right. What does a day in the life of Shane Mahoney typically look like? Uh, These days, it uh, it looks like rising pretty early, uh, beginning immediately to think about the the issues that are parading across uh, my computer that deal with wildlife issues almost exclusively uh, around the world. Uh, It's often filled very much with uh, communicating with people via email, but also a lot of interviews, a lot of telephone calls. That is, if I'm stationary and I'm not traveling somewhere around the world, um, it usually uh, involves um, some period of time for reading. I'm a, I b- believe that reading history is incredibly important to what I do, so I, I, I read a great deal of, uh, of history. And undoubtedly, part of the day is spent writing because I write a lot of articles and vignettes and things of this nature. You know, I'm mm-hmm. constantly creating messaging for uh, for conservation issues. Right. Okay. Um, so that's you know that's that's a kind of a that's kind of a standard work day for me, I guess. All right. Are you an early riser? Pretty early. Uh, I'm a six. You know, six. Okay. Pretty kind of guy. That. Kind of and do you do you end up working into the evening? Yeah, uh, often, very often. Okay. All right. Well, it's ten to eight now. Right. Oh, just curious. <laughs> right. It is. It is ten to eight where you are, and it's uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, all right. And, and last question. Um, compared to a, a typical day in the life, what's a, a typical hunting day look like for you? Well, it's of course the, the experience depends very much on the location. Unfortunately, I had the chance to travel, so it, it varies. But I mean, it's. I think it's. Uh, the most typical is an experience of, of, you know, working moose on the country here because that's what I am, you know, most familiar with. Right. And, uh, but, you know, a hunting day for me is kind of, uh, as I've explained to a lot of people, I spent a lot of my life working with animals from a research point of view. So I spent a lot of time with them, with the glasses, with the spotting scopes, you know, capturing them, darting them, crawling into their dens, capturing their calves, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But, um, as intense as all that is, um, when you hunt, of course, there's a whole other level of intensity. So I like to say that uh, a typical hunting day for me is drowning even deeper in that natural experience. And I've had a lot of it in my life, but um, the hunting experience is just, as Ortega said, you become the alert man. <laughs> and uh, right. never, you're never as alert you're never as alive, uh, you know, so that's a, that's what's typical about them all, I guess. I understand exactly what you just said, actually. Shane, this has been fantastic, and I was wondering if you could tell us and everybody that's listening to the show where we can find more information about you and your projects and the movements and the missions that you have going on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm fairly easy to find these days. I mean, it's not hard to trace people now, uh, but uh, if they just go to my website, Conservation Visions, mm-hmm. all one word, conservationvisions.com and they can find out a fair bit about me. Gotcha. And we can link uh, at the bottom, bottom of your page, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, all those social media platforms are all right there. And it looks like you've, you carry out your message on each and every one of them too. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. There on all of those. Very nice. Shane, this has been fantastic. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure speaking to you for the last hour or so. And I'm sure our listeners that have listened to the show will absolutely appreciate everything you've got going on. And if we want to help. So if there's anything we can do in the future, please reach out. We're, we're just a, a phone call or an email away. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, take care of yourself and all the best. 
Now, you can tell Shane is a deep thinker, but he's also deeply passionate about this stuff. And as he says, he gets more passion and excitement out of hanging with the animals than pretty much anything else he does in his life and his shows. And he's just, he's a world renowned conservationist and con- continues to send his message to countries. I mean, he's like the go to guy that countries go to for their conservation movements and ideas. So if you want to listen to more about conservation, check out actually Shane's new podcast over at, at uh, Conservation Matters. It's right on the iTunes. So that's that's Shane Mahoney. Yeah, very interesting feller and uh, full of knowledge about conservation, Jay. And, that, you know, the world needs more Shanes out there to uh, make sure that the habitat and conservation is taken care of. Yeah, because he makes a good point, you know, with without these efforts, um, then we can't really enjoy our life as a hunter um, whatsoever. And as as we've always said on this show, hunters are some of the world's best conservationists, despite what the anti-hunters think. So, Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? Yeah, we do, Jay. Uh, the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Going, uh, thinking about hunting season coming up. And, you know, a lot of guys park where they can see their truck from their tree stand. And if you're doing that, you know that your deer can see your truck from your tree stand. Also, whether out in the woods or in the field. Yeah, you might want to reconsider that because the deer pick up on when your vehicle is parked in that particular area. And what's that mean when you park there? That means you're in your tree stand. And uh, I don't know how smart the deer are, but just past experiences on my end, if they can see your truck, they're not going to come by your tree stand. That's true. Although sometimes when I'm out on one side of the property, all the deer are standing next to my truck. Yeah, that could happen. <laughs> also, but. Most of the time, Jay. I know. Most of the time, if you should at least. If you notify them you're there, they're, they're going to bypass where you're going to. Yeah. I mean, deer are smart. They'll pick up on your patterns. And if you go with your truck and park in that same spot every time, guess what? They're going to figure out that you're coming in shortly after that truck pulls up. That's right. And that's just the way it is. So you got to outthink them. So, well, that's great, man. Thanks for that tip of the week. That was fantastic. Thank you to Morse's Sporting Goods for sponsoring the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. And thanks to Shane Mahoney for joining us and talking all about conservation and his whole view on the world, basically, and all the conservation that we sometimes take for granted every day. Yeah, without conservation, Jay, we wouldn't be where we're at today. Yes, we, we wouldn't be on this podcast, I can tell you that. So, Dusty, where can we find you when you're not here hanging out with me on the podcast? Now shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBookRacery.com. You can also look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors, at Chasing Antler on Instagram. Hit me up. Follow me and uh, see what I got going on in my life. And uh, Jay, where can we reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Well, you can shoot me an email, Jay at BigBookRegistry.com. That's probably the best way to contact me. Give me a call at 724-613-2825. You can follow the Big Buck Registry on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All you have to do is do a search for Big Buck Registry on any of those. You can find us on iTunes, and all you have to do is do a search for Big Buck Registry. In fact, I had a, had breakfast with a buddy of mine the other day, and she goes, well, how do I find your show? And he pulled out his iPhone, and I put him right onto the, the through the, the Apple Podcast app. I said, type in Big Buck Registry, and voila, there it was, and he subscribed to the show right there in front of me in the parking lot. It's pretty cool. So uh, you can also find us now on iHeartRadio. The link has been sent. It has not shown up just yet, but it should be coming. Check it out in the next week. Uh, there's a, that's a great place to look at, look for us. Look at, find us on Stitcher. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate, and there are various levels of prizes there that you can earn by showing your patronage to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast powered by USA Trail Camps. And uh, last but not least, if you'd like to have your buck where whenever you shot it, I don't care when it was, if you want to send it in to us to be featured on our wall of fame in front of 230,000 plus diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, and all the instructions will be right there for you. And we'll take a look at it and uh, let you know if we're going to post it in front of everybody. It's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. It's a lot of big buck, brother. That's, this is a wrap, and I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And we'll see you next week. Can't wait.